Hello everybody, this is the Empirical Audio File. What I'm going to talk about is waveguides. And a waveguide like you see on this LTEC here. I designed the waveguide back in the 90s. I am a aerospace engineer and I designed this with the heavy baffle, two inch baffle for this LTEC back in the 90s. Now there's something that is going on today, which you will see a lot of manufacturers making waveguides and putting them on their speakers. If you look here, this is a speaker by Raz, and it's an American made speaker. On this particular speaker here, he uses a waveguide for the bass speaker. But yet, in his other speakers, like if you see here, this is a flush mounted speaker. And even though they both are similar, the only difference is one has a waveguide and the other one does not. Now, I'll show you another waveguide by Martin Logan. This is a waveguide that Martin Logan is using on their speakers. And as you can see, the waveguide exist on their base speaker. Now here's another audiophile channel and he uses the two speakers on left and right in the le uh, in the red. Those have waveguides on them on the base speaker. So the waveguide back in the 90s was not really pre prevalent. In fact, I never saw a speaker back in the 90s with a waveguide added to it at all. Now, waveguides can change the sound, and it can change the sound to make it bigger than what it is. As the frequency comes off of the, the speaker, it keeps increasing inside. The waveguide just allows that to keep increasing before it comes off of the baffle. So it's almost like if you have a 15-inch woofer, it's almost like having a 18 or 19 inch woofer. Now there's one thing about what LTEC did when they made these baffles back in the 70s. The baffle was about seven eighths thick, three quarter inch plywood thick, cheap plywood. And the speaker was mounted behind the baffle. So you had a three quarter inch to seven eighths thick plywood in front. So when the wave came out from the speaker, it would hit that baffle and start reflecting sound. This muddies up your sound when you start having reflection right away coming into something that's coming out and you start having reflection. Now in order to stop that reflection, you put a waveguide on. So as it comes out, it comes out nice and smooth or you can flush mount your speakers, which a lot of people do. But as you notice, look at a lot of your reviews on speakers. They all use waveguides. So this is something that I came up with back in the 90s. And it's, it's almost like since I never seen it, it took an aerospace engineer to come up with this idea of putting waveguides on base speakers. But it reacts to the bass speaker differently than if you just take the speaker and flush mount it. Now, a long time ago, when reviewers would review speakers like this, big 15-inch woofers, they would make the statement that they're slow, they're sluggish, there's more mass, and therefore manufacturers were changing over to smaller speakers, like two 8-inch woofers, two 7-inch woofers, two 10-inch woofers, staying away from the big, huge 15 12 and 15 inch woofers because they were considered to be slow, more mass to move. Well, that was false. That was a bunch of bull that they handed out to the audiophile. The writers did because that is what, how cabinets became smaller and smaller. This LTEC cabinet of this Valencia here is all made for the bass speaker. The whole cabinet. It has nothing to do with the horn. It's just holding the horn. But there's space all around the horn. That whole cabinet 
is all cabinetry for the horn. And, and I'm going to show you. So we have the big 15-inch woofer. But a lot of people, when you put a waveguide on, may make the comment that the bass doesn't sound as deep. Well, these go down to about 35 hertz. Uh, that's deep enough for me. In fact, what they seem to be looking for is deep bass. But look at this drum here. That's a 36-inch drum major drum. It's made to have low bass. You hit that, and you're going to have the realization of, well, where's this big, deep, heavy bass in music? Okay. You can still get it with a tuba or something, but if you're looking for a drum, you want tight bass. And one way I found out about tight bass is when years ago, when I had my speakers, before I modified them, I went to a salon and I listened to some high-end music, high-end equipment with some music. And one of the pieces I played was Fanfare for the Common Man by Tellart. And I'll tell you that uh, though they were only stand-mounted speakers or what other you may call bookshelf speakers, maybe a 7-inch woofer from Avalon, they blew me away with the way the drums from Fanfare of the Common Man starts out. It just blew me away. So I had to go home and listen to it because I had the same CD. Went home, put on Fanfare for the Common Man. All that information I got from the Avalon was gone. I had deep bass, but it was distorted. It wasn't as clear. You didn't have that snap to it. It was like, wow, I thought I had deep bass. But my assumption was wrong. When I first heard a real good system offer real good equipment with expensive cables and everything else, I was quite shocked to find out that Bass isn't just big, deep bass. It has to be articulated bass. It has to sound like a real bass drum would sound when it hits. And this particular speaker here puts out a lot of air coming from those two ports. Now, in this view here, this is Kodo Drummers of Japan. I don't want it to be demonetized, but you can see as the big bass drum gets hit, maybe it's six foot in diameter. Look at the piece of paper and the air movement coming out of those four inch ports. But yet, if you look at the speaker itself, it's barely moving. And that's about at 98 dB you're listening to. I mean, these speakers play at 97 dB at one meter with one watt. So you're listening to a bass drum here that's over 100 dB. And look at the air that's coming out of that cabinetry from that speaker. Yet if you look at the speaker, you can see it vibrating a little bit. But look at how the piece of paper gets sucked in and gets blown out by the bass speaker. That's, that's a big, huge difference of how much air is filling that huge cabinet to produce the bass. So this is how audiophiles get confused. They think speakers have to move a whole bunch to bring out a lot of bass. And a lot of speakers, like these theater speakers, they weren't designed to be moving like crazy and still put out over 100 decibels of sound pressure. And when you're sitting over 12 feet away, or even 16 feet away, you can feel that bass. You can feel it going through the slab of my house. You can feel that. It's very accurate, tight bass. Just like if you were to play that drum major drum that I showed you. Some people may look at a waveguide, like you're seeing here, as the bass is leaner if you put a waveguide on. But apparently a lot of manufacturers are doing it now. They're putting waveguides on their bass speakers to help increase that beat, 
bass and make it more like real bass and make the speaker bigger than what it is. It's just that audiophiles need to learn that big, boomy, deep bass is not realistic bass. As I showed you with the drum major drum, you hit that. It's not big, boomy, deep bass. It's articulated bass. You can hear it. You can hear the whack on that drum, no matter how hard you hit it. You can hear that whack on that drum. You can hear the skin going in and coming out. And that's what the waveguide, what I found out, helps with. It, it makes the sound spread out, but it makes it more pinpoint and gives you a better sound stage than without it. It's up to each manufacturer. They may put the speaker behind the baffle. That's kind of old technology today. Or they may put the speaker in front of the baffle. And we see a lot of that. We'll also see when they put the speaker in front of the baffle, like Wilson, for example, they will put foam or a felt or something around their bass speakers. This is the stop reflection. Just like in this big drum that you see here, all you have to do when you want to listen to bass, hit that drum and then go play your stereo and see, does that bass sound like when you hit that drum? Because that drum isn't super, super deep. But yet, it is very accurate, and that is what you're looking for. That's why manufacturers are doing this, for sound staging and increase the accuracy of the bass that's coming off the speaker. Now, LTEC had it right to begin with, but they did have it wrong in a way. Because the baffle was only three quarters of an inch thick, they had the whole cabinetry of the voice of the theater, the Valencia here, as its bass speaker. So the horn itself does not need a speaker cabinet. Horns can, can be placed outside of the cabinet. So if the cabinet has been designed right and tuned correctly, it will give you a lot of bass from the cabinetry. But it has to be big cabinetry. Why do you think, like Klipsch, makes such big cabinets? But Klipsch, on the other hand, is trying to not make a waveguide out of their big bass speaker. They're trying to actually make a compression driver out of their big bass speakers. Therefore, the driver that's a 15-inch driver is only going through like a 6-inch opening by 10 inches or whatever it is to compress the bass and then send it through the waveguide to make it into a horn speaker, where LTEC went the other route by just making a big speaker cabinet and putting the bass behind the baffle. So if you see old videos and stuff, it needs to be updated. These speakers need to have a two-inch baffle, as you see here, than just a three-quarter inch baffle. Plus the fact I, I show you pictures of the speaker itself. Now here's a picture of the speaker, how it looks from behind. As you can see, the speaker itself also has a piece of resin on the very back of the speaker to help deaden it and to control the speaker so the bass sounds tight and articulate it like newer speakers have. So that special resin I had made up and it's mounted to the back of the speaker to control the speaker from doing resonating frequencies with the two inch baffle. You also look at the black that's on there. That is all deadbeat. And you can see the deadbeat on the tubes to help silence the tubes so they do not vibrate. So this is something that I did back in the 90s, designed a baffle to increase the bass response, to tighten up the bass response, and it did all of that without having to buy brand new speakers. So when you see speakers today using this technique of increasing the baffle, 
That is the reason why. Some of them do it for cosmetic reasons, I've been told. Others do it because they know it can increase the bass, but also for your sound staging and all to increase what's coming off of that baffle when they only have a small woofer. And, and as you can see, even the top names like Martin Logan and stuff, they're all starting to do it. I think even Kef does it. Now we have here the uh, Appion. The Appion, this is a uh, super tweeter. And on the back, I mounted a waveguide. Now this waveguide is actually acting like a horn because I'm compressing that back super tweeter because there's a super tweeter in front and there's a super tweeter in back. And therefore the opening's only two inches so it's compressing the wave that's coming out of there. It's going through that waveguide, which that is what that is, with a two inch opening. And then I set it close to the wall so that wave bounces off the wall. Now, what it basically does, it's pretty easy. If you if you go to buy the waveguides, if you have one of these super tweeters and you would like to try it, uh, the waveguides cost 20 bucks a piece. So you got $40 invested. And you can clamp them onto the super tweeter and you can test it out, whether it makes any difference. I put it in the front. I didn't like it in the front. I put it in the back. I like it because that back wave is bouncing off the back of the wall and it seems to help with sound staging. So it's it's something that if you do have one of these super tweeters, you can go on and buy one of these waveguides and mount it like I have it and have it so you may have to take your super tweeter and push it to the back of the speaker or maybe not. It depends on what it is. And that waveguide is going to compress it, that wave, and then it's going to release the wave onto the waveguide. So there's a case in point of using a waveguide to increase the performance of the super tweeter. So this is something that uh, you'll see a lot of. And you can buy these off of Amazon. I think that's where I bought this one, off of Amazon. And it has the super tweeter in front and back. I did a review on uh, Appian super tweeter, but it was only one that faced forward. This one uh, goes back and forth. So I like to increase that back wave because a lot of speaker, speaker manufacturers are doing that, putting super tweeters on the back of the speakers to bounce off the wall to increase sound staging. And now today, uh, I don't even want to listen to the speaker without it. It just sounds better for the sound staging to have the super tweeter facing the wall and having it going through a waveguide. So the waveguide increases it without increasing the front firing super tweeter. So that's what a lot of manufacturers are doing. So waveguides, they have a purpose, but a lot of people may listen to one, a speaker with a waveguide and say, it doesn't have that deep bass. Okay. You got to learn that this is real bass. Okay, that's not deep bass. Th that needs to match your speakers. If your speakers can play that drum correctly, then you have true bass. If it cannot play that drum correctly, like uh, Kodo Drummers of Japan or Fanfare for the Common Man when they hit the timpani uh, drums, if it can't play it right, you're going to lose a lot of information. And let me tell you something. Once you hear it, once you hear it the correct way, you'll never go back. You'll say, you know what? I'd rather accept this than that big, deep, boomy, muddy, distorted bass. Yeah, it, you know, I think too many people are used to their surround sound systems and therefore they're looking for that deep bass. But, you know, that's for movies. That's not for reproducing music. That's for movies to get to crash and bang and everything else. And you're not at a concert where they're 
turning everything up super, super loud so you can hear the music, you know, when you're 45 rows back in the theater or in the venue that you're at. We're listening to music in our homes. We're trying to reproduce music. We're trying to have very, very tight bass. Tight bass will not sound as deep as muddy bass. Muddy bass is always going to sound, muddy bass is just going to sound deeper because it's muddy. That's the way it's coming to us. As you keep tightening up the bass, like a bass drum, when the skin's tight and at the right, right and you hit it, you know right away how loud it is. You'll be able to hear the skin moving. You'll be able to hear the back motion, the front motion. That's what you want. That is tight bass. When people say the bass is not tight, you, you need then to learn what good musical bass sounds like. And once you learn it, you'll never go back to the old way of thinking that, oh, I want real deep bass. If you want deep bass, you get a speaker that can play. But most of the time, deep bass just comes out as a rumble for most people when they hear it. It's just a rumble. I mean, when you listen to the bass from the speaker, it will go through. The wave will go through the cement slab I'm on. It will go through that slab, and you'll be sitting in a chair 12 feet or 16 feet away, and you'll feel that bass going through the slab, coming up your leg. You, you, you can feel that bass. You can feel it hitting you. And remember, this is coming off the speakers at over 100 dB, and yet you didn't see that speaker barely even moving because it was a theater speaker. It was designed to be... It doesn't move very much. It was a very efficient driver that LTech made. So that's all I have for this video. You have to learn really what good bass sounds like because I had to learn. I'm not going to tell you I knew the right way. I listened to my speakers for years and years and thought I had great bass until I heard what good bass sounds like from those Avalon speakers off of high-end equipment, the Conrad Johnson and some Kimber cable. And I was shocked. I was so disappointed in my speaker that you see here before I modified it. I was so disappointed. I was going to get rid of the speakers because they weren't reproducing bass nowhere near to what the Avalons were. And that's the same with here. The waveguide opens up that wave bounces off the wall, and you'll get a better sound stage. So that's all for this video. You can uh, you can buy these waveguides, like I said, for about 20 bucks a piece. So subscribe to my channel. Try to learn what real good tight bass sounds like, and you'll be very happy. So until ne next time, this is the Empirical Audio File. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.